For more fun in the sun with friends and family this summer, your friendly neighborhood Safeway is the best place to start. You'll find great deals on crowd-pleasing favorites everyone will love. For delicious burgers on the grill, pick up fresh 80% lean ground beef for just $1.99 a pound. And get a sweet deal on selected varieties and sizes of Bluebell ice cream for only $3.99, limit two. Tastier meats, sweeter deals, better summers. Safeway, happy to be your new neighborhood store at 10500 Olmerton Road, Largo. Blog Talk Radio. the George Baker selection and some Jolly Echo from me and Little Green Bag from one of the all time favourite films of all time Hello Hi James Hello. Oh, do we? <laughs> it could be the the dreaded curse of AT and T. I think those people hate me now, and <laughs> quite right. <laughs> yeah, they're they're monitoring our calls now, and and it's going to be it's going to be hell from this point on. So, <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. Well, it was very bizarre that that we we had the, we had them out twice that week, and the little man that came second um, was absolutely terrified of my dog. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. I think my dog was actually bigger than he was but um <laughs> even though I had him under control he made me lock him in the downstairs bathroom so um <laughs> i'll be i'll be billing at and t for uh for a new bathroom <laughs> door i think 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, I, to be I, fair, I mean, you know, the, the, I, 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 I think the dog was picking up on my stress because it was like the second day in a week, second day in three, that um, AT and T had completely, completely wasted my. But the, the guy that came on the Monday had made such a hash of the whole thing, hence the technical problems we had on the show on the Wednesday. Uh, the, guy, mm. the guy just, he couldn't believe it. So because my stress levels were up and the dog picked up on that and he was ready to kill us. <laughs> he, he wanted yeah, to taste yeah. blood, I think. <laughs> Bless him. And he's a little sweetie. He's a, he's, he's a sweeter. I mean, he's only 120 pounds. <laughs> oh, only, <laughs> oh, massive, only. You know, so, well, you know. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, so the, the guy was, um, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not comfortable with the dog. So he's not comfortable with you either, wasting my time. So <laughs> do your job. Get out of my house, you know. Otherwise, he might just get off his off his leash here, you know. So uh, I've never seen somebody work so quick rewiring a modem. Is the truth? Is the truth? Well, you so know, that's, um, that's incentive to work faster. So I keep exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the fact that the dog was locked in the downstairs, but it really wasn't fair on the dog, to be honest with you. Um, but um, hey, but hopefully, fingers crossed, it is fixed now. And if AT and T listening, hey, love you people. <laughs> yeah. Right until right until Xfinity send me uh, my week. I get a weekly mailer from them. So please come back to us. And you know, I think their 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 marketing line is we're not quite as crap as AT and T. Yeah. So it could oh, well God. be. <laughs> well, the only problem is what? what do you, I mean, here's, here's a quandary for you. Know, you you want to change. Um, providers but of course it means trading in your dvr player and i've got yeah. sort of two yeah. years worth of ncis on there that i've not watched yet what do you do uh-huh. you know do you think oh you know oh, sorry gibbs you know we're gonna have to <laughs> miss a couple of seasons or what i don't know try and watch it yeah. up, you know just schedule and, two you know, weeks have, and watch it yeah i have found that there really is no really good provider anyway so you just you just pick one and make the best of it i don't think that any one anymore is better than another. I mean, I've had problems with all of them, so you just kind of, you know, do with whatever you have. <laughs> well, you know, funny enough, that that's what I thought. Well, I could go through all the ring roll of changing, but you know, if you think come, even if it's taking two bloody days, you know, you think come fix it. Um, you yeah. know, so to be again, I'm touching a lot of wood here. The uh, internet's been fine; it's not crapping out every ten minutes. Um, the TV's sort of on most of the time. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. it, it's better, put it that way. It's better. So yeah, what's and I happening to... in your life? Sorry, I'm bored uh, now. I'm moving on. I'm moving yeah. on because I'm yeah, sure our I listener wanted... doesn't want to listen to me <laughs> whining about AT and T for two hours. So, um, yeah, what's been going on with you, my dear? Um, well, first of all, I want to say I love that opening music. I was jamming. I, I was. That was really yeah, me good. Too. Do you know, it, <laughs> it came up on my um, on my iPod in the car the other day, and I haven't heard it for so long, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I thought it's it was really worth, worth it. Worth it. Worth it. it, it, it you can't help but feel happy. It's a happy I know, song. I know. Like, definitely. I, I was definitely like grooving, it. yeah. I was definitely yeah, good. <laughs> Good. And what's, no, I'm, what's I'm new? Very for, let's see. What's new from last week? I can't really say a whole he- heck of a lot. So you know. Um, well, that's that's, you know, that's that's dull. That's dull. I know. I know. I mean, we'll I just know. make come on, make make something up. You know. <laughs> make something up. Uh, um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> that trip to the I, moon I, that you took. You know. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but having said that, you know, I've seen pictures of the moon. <laughs> Boring. To be honest. Boring. It's dull. <laughs> It reminds me, many, um, many years ago, it was the first vacation I took with my, with my, well, I'm sure it was my wife then, with my wife. Um, we went to Fuerteventura, which is some little island in the middle of there's no sea somewhere. And that was dull, wasn't it? It was just boring. It was just, just sand. I mean, well, you know, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, know, um, yeah I've, been, I've been writing a whole lot, so that's definitely um, good. Um, you know the story. Uh, I just it just won't let me go. Won't leave me alone, which is good. I mean, you know, when you have those moments, because there's there's definitely been times where I've gone, oh goodness, a really long time without writing anything, and uh, it 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 you get to a point where um, it's almost like you. I I can't really say you forget how, but you know, the passion is kind of gone for a while. So when you do have it, you have to kind of harness it and. Um, you know, for me, I have to stay in that world with you know, music that I'm listening to and trying not to 
get too wrapped up in, in anything else, which I have to say, I just finished uh, the, the Erotic Odyssey of Colton Porsche, and I loved oh, so, it. Oh, do you know that? that yeah, who, who, who wrote that again? Who, who was the author of that? Remind uh, us. The author's James Longmore. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, yeah, one of my favorite yes. authors. I, I know. I, I, I'm going to have to add more of his books to my to be read list now because that was yeah, I think you should because, yeah, <laughs> if you could do that sort of now because, you know, the kids will be going back to school in a month or so and they need shoes. <laughs> yeah. So anyone listening, right. buy my books. Otherwise, the kids can be barefoot again this year. So, you know, and they, they yeah. get picked on. You know, the kids in the class without shoes. Or books, oh, you know. So, <laughs> please buy buy the erotic Odyssey of Colton Fourche. Um, no, I'm, so I'm, 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 I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know, it was um, it was fun writing. I hope that came across. <laughs> you know, there were some parts of it I was like, oh my goodness, he comes off as such a sweet, such a nice guy. He's he's demented though. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> In a good yeah, way. You're not wrong way. there. Yeah. You're not wrong you're not there. Wrong. <laughs> I'm not always. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, 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 it's really always good. nice to, to get some feedback, you know, um, because, you know, you write these things, you beat your niece, you, 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 your baby, and you nurture it, and it's mm-hmm. out there. And, of course, you know, it, 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 it's difficult to, you never know 100% how it's going to be received out, out in the big wide yeah. world, you know, and, um you know, you you hope it's going to be good, and I know for something like like the Odyssey of the Erotic Odyssey of Colton Fourche, which is pretty much out there. I mean, it was it was my ra- my my brain in sort of free fall. <laughs> uh, I just let it just took the harness on, just let it let it romp, you know. And so there's always the danger oh, yeah. that I've, maybe I've gone a little bit too far, but you know. And I do what I want all my beta readers. I said, for God's sake, you know, when you read it, <laughs> don't eat while you're reading this, you know. Oh my God, I know. I know that's definitely there are some parts. Now, having said advice. that, uh, my my creature novel Peed, uh, which is about you know killer centipedes, uh, as you would uh-huh. guess, um, <laughs> a good friend of mine was, was a beta reader for that, and he said he read that, and he he literally, and he's a grown man, checked under his bed before he went just to try turn the lights out because it creeped it creeped him out of that much, and that's you know for me that that means a job well done. <laughs> You've got under right. somebody's skin that much that they they have to check <laughs> under the bed. Then yeah, result. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, hey. Stop so that. anyway, Christina, who who? So I'm 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 again bored with that now. So I've got a very short attention span, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I, I to be honest with you, I'm I'm excited because we have um a great a great author, Patrick James Ryan, on the other line. And I've been looking forward to speaking to him for a long, long time. Um, I've actually got his book, um, The Night It Got Out, uh, on my Kindle, and I'm a a chapter or two into that. Uh, I mean, listen to this for a tagline. It's, uh, uh, Magnus Pass, Colorado, is about to experience an onslaught from a beast with unrivaled killing capacity. I mean, what, where, where can you, what could possibly go wrong? You know, right. something's got out. What 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 could possibly go wrong there? You know, and it it it's, it's got me gripped. I mean, I, I, my only regret That's is I'm, I'm reading that many things at the moment. I can't you know <laughs> I can't just sit and just read that. Um, I'm going right. to have to right. do that. You know, so what I'd like to do, I, I think I think we need to talk to this man. I think yes, we need sir. to talk. I to agree with him. you. <laughs> so let's 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 bring Patrick in. Um, he, he said pressing buttons frantically. Patrick, are you there, sir? I sure am, James. How are you? Hey, I am fantastic. Great to talk to you, finally. Finally, yes. finally, finally. Great. <laughs> Great to talk to you, Christina. Oh, yeah. Christina's there as well. She's she's sort of fair. <laughs> so yeah, I was saying, I was saying that, Patrick. Um, you know, I, I I've I, I've had the book on my Kindle a little while now. Um, the first chapter just just grabbed me. I mean, I just thought. Like you say, oh, what could go wrong? <laughs> Transporting <laughs> some military grade creature thing. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know. So, I mean, over to you. I mean, you you tell us what does go wrong. Well, I appreciate your, and I'm very flattered and honored about by your comments. My my intent was to write kind of a a return to, to the old fashioned B movie nor with an action thriller that just grabs you by the jugular. It's quick hit uh-huh. with a lot of action and just will not let go from page one throughout the entire story. I intentionally did not 
do some in-depth development with my characters because I wanted the monster to drive the action. So I received a little bit of feedback that, you know, there wasn't a tremendous amount of empathy uh, for Don Gerard, the police officer, as well as Elliot Harmon, who was the former Green Beret colonel from Vietnam that was instrumental in creating this beast. Um, but nevertheless, people loved the action. And I'm actually ironically getting feedback that, hey, you left us hanging, you opened it up for a sequel, I wished it was longer. So it's been very, very positive feedback, and I've been very honored by that. Fantastic. Was that your intention, to sort of leave it open for a, for a sequel, or is it just that's just the way it turned out? <clears throat> no, I was absolutely blindsided that people would look at it through that lens, and it, it made me think about maybe doing a sequel, because I do leave the audience hanging somewhat with the ending, which I won't say because it's a bit of a spoiler, but uh, it, it does give me pause to maybe want to dive in and do a sequel and continue those characters. Awesome. Awesome. And you said, you said this, this, from what I've read so far, I mean, the story obviously could, could lend itself to um, sequel after sequel, I guess. It could potentially be. And it's, it's, it's nothing that's new. In fact, the storyline could be even perceived as being rather trite because it's kind of, you know, messing with Mother Nature and uh, with this nefarious conspiracy with the military and the government being involved. So it, it's an old f formula that's been done before, but probably not this feral and not quite this uh, in your face with such a vicious uh, monster. Well, you know, they, 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 they do say that, you know, there's, there's nothing new. Um, you know, funnily enough, um, I've, I've sort of been getting into Stranger Things, which is, I believe, a Netflix original series. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard of that. Um, he I said have. silence. Sil I, I tell you something. It, it is again. It, it, it really got me in, in mind of, 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 of Patch. See, tell you what, you know, next time I get a sales call while I'm on the air, I'm going to actually answer it and let people listen. <laughs> the people are trying to sell me shit that I don't want um, yeah it, it's very similar it's obviously there's a, a military thing something has got out of the facility we don't know yeah I think I'm on, on episode 3 now but it, it's very reminiscent of the, the 80s I mean it's set, it's set in the 80s obviously but it's you know, your kids on bikes it's like E.T. it's like J.J. Abrahams um, oh what was it called oh the the the, 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 the creature one the um uh where the kids were making a movie you know my, my brain's not what it used to be but it's that that sort of era that's you know the, the pre-cell phones kids on bikes and you know the kids are going to be the heroes and that sort of thing sinister things going on and you know that sort of thing really, i mean really in, in that sort of format i think the night it got out would really Really, be awesome. I mean, is it something you've considered there, uh, Patrick? Is maybe is adapting it as a screenplay? I have, and the the old cliche is that a writer can't write a screenplay, and I'm going to, going to try to break that mold, or at least partner with someone that does write a good screenplay, because I I see this as being a very thrilling movie, and I don't want to throw Hollywood under the bus, but it seems like the recent trend has been either remakes or things that don't really have good storylines. And I think that some of the stuff that's coming mm -hmm. out of Nick's shop and, and some of these other small press horror publishers mm -hmm. would make movies. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, I think one of the, the best not so mainstream movies I've seen in a long time was 10 Cloverfield Lane, because it, it, wasn't, all, it wasn't yeah. heavily relying on... See, it wasn't big CGI things fighting CGI things. The plot was tight. It was... You know, everything everything hit home. It was great. It was incredibly well written. And I, I, to be honest, I, I don't I don't know who's told you writers can't write screenplays, Patrick, because we can. Um, I actually, before I wrote novels, I wrote screenplays. Uh, so if, if you if you want to chat sometime about screenplays, we can chat about screenplays. Uh, what I did find difficult was adapting a screenplay to a novel, which I, I just it took me a lot longer than I expect. I thought, oh, this will be easy. This. I would think the other way around, you know, certainly for, for someone who writes like you, would be, I think you would find it easy. I think, you know, with the, the, the skill set you have, you could do that. And I would love to see it as a movie. It would be great. I could, I, could, I could see myself sat watching that, definitely. Fantastic. I appreciate those words of encouragement. And my understanding when doing a screenplay that brevity is the word. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, keep keep it brief. Uh, show, not tell. I mean, the thing I, I you have to remember, and I, I fell far when I wrote my first couple of screenplays, was putting too much detail in. Because, yeah. I mean, and, and I, I saw one recently of a, 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 a friend. I mean, I think they're an ex-friend now because I did give them honest feedback. Um, oh, you know, and they, 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 they showed, you know, a couple of guys pulled up outside a school and one guy said, why are we sitting here outside the school? Yeah. Now, in a novel, you, you may need to do that, or you need you've got to say somewhere they're outside the school. But of course, with a screenplay, you can see it. You can yeah, see that. So you just say, so "Why are we here?" Boom. You know, like you say, then you don't have to. And I think, yeah, that's probably where novelists. Again, I put myself in that category. You no, know, we novelists would actually fall down. And I find, you know, a screenplay takes a few goes through to <laughs> to take some of that out because you you have to leave a lot of it for the director to actually mm. visualize. So he may visualize it different or whatever. If you put too much stuff in, it, it, it tends to, they get a bit pissy. I think <laughs> he's telling me my job, you know, it's like, it's like booking a taxi and, you know, telling the guy how to drive, you know. <laughs> exactly. You, got you go out the door. Yes. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you think you have to, and, you know, I've, I've read a lot of, I suggest you do the same, but, you know, you read a lot of articles about, you know, the writer's <clears throat> experience um, going through Hollywood. And it, it, it's never a nice one because they, they take your script, you love it, you're proud of it, and they take it to pieces. I mean, they literally do. For one reason or another, you know, so we've got to have Tom Cruise in it, this has got to happen, that's got to happen. Um, I if you remember, I forget which film it was, and they said, you know, you've got to have giant killer spiders in it. Well, there's no place for it and <laughs> there were giant killer spiders somewhere in that movie because the producer said there's got to be some in you know so i think you know there's two ways you can either look at it as an artist and say no they're never going to change it and then obviously you remain poor or you just let it go uh, again cue for another film uh, let it go let them do what they want and bank the check <laughs> you've got to decide where you need to be I mean, wait, wait, yep. I mean, I'll, I'll throw it on to you, Patrick, you know, as a fellow writer. I mean, he, he, do you write for the love of it or do you write because it's a living, you want to make money out of it? Probably. Which camp are you in? Yep, I think it's both. I have, I have a good day job, but if I could make the level of income writing that I do during the get day job, I would say bye-bye to the day job in a heartbeat. I always had passion for writing, and, and of course, once you get married and civilized and domesticated and start – uh, uh, it, it got put on the back burner, but now that the kids are a little bit older, uh, I lost my father a few years ago, and then I started to find solace staying up late at night, and the stories just started to come. And then I really started going after it. I was able to connect with Nick, and, uh, and then here I am now. Awesome. Oh, so of course we 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 have we have Nick Gravowski on later as well, um, and I'm, I'm again excited to speak to him. He he picked up my my creature novel Pede, uh, which is oh, nice. doing incredible well at the moment, and uh, I will be eternally grateful for that. Um, you know, so yeah, again, it's good. I think in in the in the the, the horror market, you know, that there are a good number of um, independent publishers. Probably more so than any other market, I think, which gives writers a, a, a good opportunity to get a foot on the ladder. Right. I agree, and I, you know, I, I tried to be an eclectic swath of writers, ranging you know from you know from King to folks like yourself uh, and, and our you know, our contemporary peers to even people like Grisham and and James Patterson and whatnot. But there's nothing as feral and as catching to me as the horror suspense sci-fi genre. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would, I would totally agree. Um, and and there are some incredibly good um, independent authors out there. But I, I guess it, it's like you know actors who start off in you know provincial theatre and TV ads and that, and that they you know the, the the aim is to be to be up there, you know. Um, and I think the, the the likes of Nick and the fight likes of you know Jaded books uh publishing etc there you know it, it is a good it's a good foot on the ladder you know it, it gives gets published it gets our work out there and not nothing says more to you know when, when you you finally get to that point where you're looking for an agent you want to approach the big six or the big five or whatever it is now um to say you know look here here's a book here's a paper book you can touch and feel and 
lick if yeah. you want, you know, that's got my name on <laughs> it. I wrote this. Somebody has seen enough in this to publish and market it. And I think, I mean, that, that's partly been my strategy is, is, to, is to build up a library of stuff that's you know, been published, not self-published, just published, um, and then hopefully take the next step into... Um, so if there's any agents out there listening, then uh, call me. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Call me too. <laughs> exactly. I think we're all on the same boat on that one. And it's funny you say that because I'm working on a mainstream detective thriller right now trying to transcend a little bit past just horror, more mainstream. And that would be one that uh, hopefully one of the big press publishers would go after that uh, Nick would help me with. And I've already told him he and I would partner on that. So, Oh, that is fantastic. So is, is, it, is, it, is it not horror at all? Is it you going down the, the, the detective route? I mean, tell us a bit about it. It, um, it has elements of horror because the, the killer – and the diabolical way that he is killing his victims um, definitely gets into war. So, you know, think of something as bloody and nasty as the movie Seven with Morgan Freeman and uh, yes. and Brad oh, Wow. And put it on steroids. Uh, so it's a very, awesome. very diabolical individual, and and this is a Philadelphia homicide detective trying to stop him. So pretty mainstream. And I, I, with Nick's connections, I told Nick, I said, Hey, Nick, you know. It, no, nobody probably better than you as an agent. Whatever I would get, you're going to get a chunk. So wherever I go, you're going to go. So he knows he's he's stuck with me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to ask him about that when he when he's you know. Do, do you really feel stuck with Patrick? Exactly. You know. <laughs> Is that how you feel? Is that how the relationship? You're just stuck with him. You know, Mr. So, Gabowski, oh. <laughs> that if old Patrick yeah. makes it big, Mr. Gabowski's going to make it big. So yes. Well, there you go. Yeah. You go. So, how how far along are you with um, with that particular work there, Patrick? That one's going to be a big one. I'm about 175 pages, and it's only part one out of three parts. So that was wow. probably awesome. Quite a bit of editing. So it's kind of a monster undertaking. Um, I've got another one that's going to come out with Nick. That's a little novella here very soon called "The Maggots Underneath the Porch." Uh, that's kind of my lame attempt at Stephen King, uh, the body stand <laughs> by me, circa. 1975, when Jaws came out and kids were collecting beer cans and baseball cards set against the backdrop of a horrific event, and then another collection of short stories before this big mainstream thriller would be released. Wow. So when, when, when will that be next year? The, the, I think the big it's one. 17, yes. I, I would not probably be ready uh, this year with, uh, with so many competing priorities and other things going on, and I'm doing edits on another one that I'm hoping Nick will be able to get to uh, in time for Christmas, which is a second sh- short story collection. Wow. Wow, you are busy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, I mean, you know, we, we obviously speak to a lot of writers on this show, and we, we all seem to be incapable of just having one project on the go. I, I always have two or three on the go, usually more. You know, I mean, do you think that is, is that a common thread? I see it, yes, very much so, because I will hit that proverbial writer's block wall, and then I will go back to something that I've written two or three months ago, and I'll read it, and I'll think, what in the hell were you thinking about, Patrick, because it just sounds awful. Yeah. And then I can go in and look at it <laughs> fresh set of eyes and, and kind of edit it and restructure it, and then it's much more polished. And I find that to be a good cure uh, for the writing block, and then it gets the juices flowing, and then I return back to the current project, so I'm often bouncing back and forth between uh, a couple of different projects, which probably sounds absurd, but it's a good formula for me. Yeah, no, I like it. Yeah, yeah I mean, is, is that how you work, Xtina? Um, no, I'm I'm kind of a one-track mind kind of thing, and I have to stay in whatever world you know I, I'm writing in. But that is the one good thing about you know also that I I I'm a poet is that you know. If I'm bored, or not, I can't even say bored, but if I, I'm, I'm not having a good night as far as my writing goes, I can, you know, quickly write a poem. And that kind of helps me stay creative. But And, and it makes me feel like I'm doing something, even if I'm not working on my work in progress. So, you know, I, I try to always stay writing. And that's what I've heard is, you know, 
one of the uh, keys to success uh, as far as being a writer is just keep writing. You know, don't stop. Because once you stop, a lot of times you lose that momentum. I, I think, yeah, I find that when you, you, you stop for whatever reason and then trying to pick it back, that's hard. You know, say you have mm-hmm. a week where it's vacation or you've been ill or whatever, or you just couldn't be yeah. bothered, you know, and you uh, just, just trying to get it, get, get the brain. I suppose it's, it's, I mean, the, the brain is an essential a, a muscle. I, mean, I could give you a, a biology lesson if you want. Um, <laughs> you know, be, well, n- n- nerve, um, nerves are actually uh, evolved from muscle. So it's pretty much, you know, when they say your brain's a muscle, it is, which means it needs to be used. It's like, you know, you suddenly you don't go to the gym for a while and then you go and you're, shit, you know, I ache, you know, <laughs> because right. you're using muscles right. that haven't been used. Right? And again, you need to do that with your brain. But uh, I read a great quote, which I think is incredibly misleading. Um, thinking about writing is writing. I think, you know, to some extent, yeah, but really, no. Because you can say, no, I, I know people I who think about it and they, they sit in Starbucks and talk loudly about writing, but they never actually bloody write. And this guy I know yeah. um, who has been talking the same idea for six years, the six years I've known him since I moved to the States. And he's still, and in that time, I've had four novels, a couple of novellas and a bunch of short stories written, polished and published. And he's still talking on the same ideas, you know. And, yeah. You know, so yeah, I think be careful. Don't just spend your time right at re- uh, thinking about it because you know thoughts really don't translate awfully well into paper. No, no, they don't. As a matter of fact, with the story that I'm writing now or trying attempting, um, I have tried to sit down with my pen and paper because the thoughts are just not, um, or but they're not taking shape. So you know, I try to jot down and, and try to figure out and plot and plan what's happening next and nothing is coming and it's not until I'm actually sitting you know at my computer and uh, I'm in the scene that I can see what's coming next and it's it's really bizarre because many times I'm finding um, the story is just being told through me uh, there's so many times I'm thinking mm-hmm. am I even in, in who's in charge here because it doesn't feel like I am <laughs> It's a, it's a really good feeling, but uh, many times I'm 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 left thinking I'm not the one coming up with this. I'm really not because I can just see things as I'm writing them. It's really kind of strange. Yeah, is, is that how it works for you, Patrick? Would you say, or did you you work very very structured? No, I'm the same way. I mean, you have to get uh, to put it in an athletic parallel or an analogy. You kind of got to get in the zone. Now, I've been a martial arts for a number of years, and you. You know, you, you learn different forms or katas. Mine was an animal-based system, tiger, dragon, you know, crane, yeah. uh, and dragon, all those. And you get to the point where it's instinctual. You do it without even thinking. And I think the old mm-hmm. adage, imperfect action is better than no action at all, you start writing. And once you start writing, eventually that flow will start to get there. And before you know it, then you're in the zone. So it's kind of forced, even though you're not ready and you don't feel like it, I try to discipline myself to do at least a little bit every day. Yeah, yep, I have to do that yeah. too to keep in the story. Yeah, I think I think we writers are probably top of the list. I think when it comes to procrastination, I mean, it was Charles Dickens <laughs> himself said that procrastination is the thief of time. And you know, I didn't know how bad it could be. You know, I, I, I'm easily distracted anyway, but. You know, yeah. I'm almost. I get to the point where, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm, I'm, I'm sat down. I'm sat down. I've got my, my, my backside <laughs> is on the chair. Oh, I've got to make a coffee. Oh, the dog needs to go out, and the dog doesn't. Yeah. Look, see, I don't. I don't want to go. You, you know, going out. You know, and it's just like anything. Just, to, but then when you sit there and, and Patrick, you know, hit the nail on the head, you get in that zone. Because even sometimes I think, well, I don't know what's going to happen next. So how can I? Because I, I do at least have some sort of skeleton structure so i know where the story is going to go otherwise i'll just ramble it. it'd be a 2000 page <laughs> ramble you know um but the next Stephen king <laughs> well i mean he, he, I, I don't know how he, whether he works or structure or not but you know right. he, he 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 can craft an incredibly well structured story um you know, so thinking, I don't know what happens next. Well, like as Patrick said, you sit, you get in that zone, and then what happens next is what comes out of your head, even if you don't know I before know. you sit down. It does. But, you think, I need to get from the, I need to get my character from here to there. This yeah. needs to happen, and it just comes mm. and this stuff. And it, once you get there, and it is, you know, one of the best feelings in the world when it happens. But um, it, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's just, 
getting there. Just <laughs> the last scene, the last scene that I wrote, I remember sitting down to start writing, and I literally had no idea what was going to happen next and where I was going. Uh, I knew I'm, you know, I'm I'm in a scene and I'm writing, and then it just comes to me out of nowhere. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, part of me was actually a little uh, like exhausted thinking about it because I'm like, oh my goodness, it's not going to be a short scene. This is a lot to accomplish, but it was also so exciting and and really just amazing how it just came out of nowhere. I mean, so that's why I say I don't think I'm the one driving the boat here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you know, sometimes it, 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 you know, people do ask, you know, where do your ideas come from? And, well, from yeah. out of my brain, really. And that's as far as I can tell you. I don't yeah. know. You know, so even when you yeah. read it back, you say, where the hell did that come from? It's almost yeah. like you're, you're writing somebody else's memories, you know. That, well, that never happened to me. I've never read I, I don't know where it's come from. I, I yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I a quick agree. question for Patrick. Um, obviously, you've, you've, you've written the horror, thriller, you're writing, you're detective. Is there a genre that is so far removed from either of those that you would really, really like to work in? Any particular story you're asking? No. Is, 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 I mean, personally, you know, I, I would love to be able to write a really, really good children's story. Um, I mean, is there a genre? Are you sort of? You always wanted to, always wanted to write a sort of a historical romance or science fiction, mm-hmm. or you know, is there something you really like to have a crack at? Yeah, in fact, uh, because of my tenure in martial arts, I'm actually working on a story now called Honor Bound, and I'm copying a little bit from the movie Ninja Assassin. If you guys follow that genre at all or know much about martial arts, but it's a Kind of if you saw, you know, James Clavell's Shogun, and yes. and I talked to him about this. He said, hey, you know, we might we might consider that through black bed sheet books because you know there's flying heads from samurai swords cutting them off and all that. So there's elements uh-huh. of horror, but it's more of a Japanese martial art type story. But a ninja clan is assigned to kill a rising political figure. He's not there. Mm-hmm. So they kill the daughter, but kidnap an 18 month old son. Take the son back yeah. to the clan, and he all they do is 16 hours a day train him, and he rises to be the top assassin and the best martial artist in all of Japan. At the age, oh, of, wow. 20, the age of 21, he commands the highest salary for any assassination throughout the entire country. He's, he gets a current assignment to kill a political figure at that time, who then he's doing his due diligence and research, and he actually finds out it's his real biological father. And he's oh, a good wow. man, oh, wow. and what he will do is good for Japan. Yet he loves his clan and is dedicated to his clan, so he's torn, and is he honor-bound to his biological father, who's a good person, or is he honor-bound mm-hmm. to the clan, and will he carry out the assassination? So that's kind of breaking, again, the mold of the horror genre, but that's kind of kind of crossing over into other territory, and uh, I'm about 70 pages into that one. Wow. That sounds again. It sounds like a, a, a sounds great. I mean, it sounds like a, a heck of an undertake. I mean, Shogun. I mean, the, the the novel itself was huge. Yes, absolutely yeah. huge, huge book. Um, but yeah, I remember. I remember the TV show that was back in the what, the seventies. I think late seventies. With 70s Chamberlain. With syndication, all the reruns and everything. I just ended up buying it just because of my passion for martial arts. Uh huh. Yeah, it was a, and then there was the the, the recent one with, um, or oh, recent, relatively recent, with Tom Cruise, where he 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 was in Japan. I can't remember what it was called now. Um, and he 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 became a a, a warrior and all the rest. But again, a great great film. You know, really. Yeah, uh, Samurai. That was a good a, one. That was it. Yeah, I mean, a bit of a Tom Cruise fan, to be honest with you. I think you'd get the guy's awesome, but. Um, there you go. Really? <laughs> That's my guilty secret. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, 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 I enjoy his movies. I, I think he's good. There's just something about him. That he's just got that charisma yeah. that, that carries a movie. I think he's. I, I, I like the guy. Yeah. Yep, Do you know too. what movie he was? You know what movie he was in that I I watched the whole thing before and then I saw the credits at the end and they said his name and I was like, what? I had to go back and look again. Tropic Thunder. <laughs> Tropical Thunder. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, have yeah. you seen that? Oh, that is, I really, that movie tickles me. It really does. But the scenes with him, 
Wow. You know, I had no clue that was him. And he, that, that was, I think it's funny. Yeah. Thank you. He, he really sends himself up. I mean, it was, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good old, good old. We should start the Tom Cruise fan club, you know. <laughs> Maybe give him a part in one of our films. Yeah. Give <laughs> the guy get, get, uh... <laughs> have him be the shooting guy in one of our uh, movies. That'd be awesome. Or one of our books that turned into a movie, I should say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he could be the guy that gets eaten by the giant centipedes in Mono Mine. <laughs> Although, you know, he, he would, thinking about it, he would make a great Colton Fauché, I think, when, when, if and when that's ever made into a movie. What do you think, Christina? Wow. Tom Cruise? You think Tom so? Tom Cruise you know, is have... Colton Fauché. Yeah. That, that's great. something that I don't think I even, even pictured him at all. That's weird. Usually I, I do <laughs> dreamcast a character that... They were really hard to Dreamcast, though. They really were. <laughs> but you had me <laughs> caught by the very first sentence. I've actually read that first sentence out to a couple of people. Like, oh, my goodness, can you believe this first sentence here? <laughs> 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 awesome. I know. I know. I, I awesome. really enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I mean, again, here's a clumsy segue. Speaking of reading, um, could could we could we bother you to read an excerpt from your uh, the night it got out, um, Patrick. Do you have something for us? I do. I'd be have honored. I you, have I put you on the spot? <laughs> you know, some people. No, you can't ask me that. That would be great if you if you would, if you care to read us some out. That would be awesome. I'd be happy to. Extina kind of prepped me for that, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a <laughs> setup on this. Uh, this is a little okay. bit, a little bit into the story, and and the creature was being taken to NORAD by a couple of Navy SEALs when there was a snowstorm that caused a massive accident, and it enabled the creature to escape. So it is descended on this fictitious town in Colorado, Mang- Mangus Pass, Colorado, and it is about to get inside of a grocery store. It had been kept, kept and used by humans in its past, and it has venomous hatred towards humans. So this excerpt is kind of picking it up right as it's about to get into uh, this grocery store. So I've got about seven or eight pages, and Extina said about five, six minutes of, of reading. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and start if you guys are ready. Go for it. Yep, the, yeah. the, the airwaves are all yours, sir. Sounds good. The creature had been tearing through the forest, heading west towards downtown Mangus Pass for about an hour after its escape on the highway before pausing to peer down into a valley of lights and noise. More humans. The beast felt rage and anger swell up inside its brain against the species trying to control it. It had a long-standing history dealing with this species, easily killing it whenever presented with an opportunity. The creature had been under the control of the human many years ago, but it broke away and freedom was precious, too precious to give up. How dare they attempt to catch it again and squelch the freedom. They would suffer for trying to control its life. The beast's belly was full from the flesh gorged at the highway, and twice it stopped to move its bowels with loose feces still getting reacquainted with human tissue in its system instead of the dull nuts, plants, and dead carrion provided by its recent captors the last four months. The forest was very different than it was accustomed to, but some solace and intrigue was found in the new interesting type of trees and brush, which temporarily alleviated some of its concern about the strange wet white substance covering the ground and the highway. However, these particular plants and trees looked dead, devoid of growth, vegetation, and nourishment. Very strange, and it puzzled the creature. Shivering, it longed for the warmth of its normal environment, and the lights below promised heat, food, and other comforts lacking in this dead forest. Delbert Miller and his wife, Zelma, were the first customers at Sawyer's Grocery Store, 7 a.m. sharp when the doors opened. The Millers were retired in the early 70s and started their day at sunrise each morning with bacon, eggs, and coffee with the trip to the grocery store once a week, acting like a date for them. They were closely followed by Bonnie Huffstetler, rushing in to get some donuts from the bakery for a morning real estate broker meeting, Sam Hartman, who seemed to stop in every morning since his wife died of a stroke last year, headed over to the meat department to chat with the butcher. Neil Dolby headed for the beer aisle. Mina Zen, the pretty librarian at the Mangus Pass Metropolitan Library, followed Bonnie Huffstetler to the bakery for a birthday cake for her boyfriend and some oatmeal. By 7.30, the store was bustling with about 70 people, shopping in every aisle going through the normal nuances and navigation of ordinary life. 
in 15 minutes, ordinary life would evolve into an obscene nightmare of sheer horror. The beast crept from the cover of the woods at the end of the parking lot by the loading dock at the rear of Sora's grocery store to the large open door where it could hear human voices and the bustling and grinding of forklifts, dollies, and box cutters opening shipments. The sound of human voices made it angry again. It passed flatulence silently, still feeling satiated from the enormous amount of food consumed at the highway. This particular hunt would be purely for vengeance and to hone its craft again after such a long hiatus. Years of training, conditioning, and hunting nurtured a single-minded purpose in the beast to exemplify and epitomize a supreme lethal killing machine. Jeff Richards walked back behind the warehouse door leading out to the parking lot for a quick smoke before the forklift shift began. He just let the camel when someone pushed him hard in the back. Jeff's first thought was that Ben Creighton snuck away from the fish department with another joint to smoke like last Wednesday, and he started to speak out in protest to the shove when he suddenly realized he could not talk. Four long streaks of blood seeped through the front of his T-shirt, and he coughed up red-tinged phlegm and mucus from two badly punctured lungs. Gasping, he lunged forward and struggled to stay upright and catch his breath. He painstakingly turned around and was emotionally struck with an electrical charge of horror at the mere sight of an incomprehensible creature, and he knew he was dead. A huge paw with razor-sharp claws tore deep into his neck, separating Jeff's head from his body in a split second. The beast was already moving before the body hit the floor. It slunk along the side of three forklifts, smelling and hearing additional humans milling about on its right flank. A consummate master of stealth above all animals, it closed in on two men using box cutters to open large receivables of canned vegetables. The men were engaged in a discussion on the efficacy of the winter pitching trades for the Rockies' upcoming season next April when the creature disemboweled the first man with a blurring blow of claws and sprang on the second man, stifling a scream by sinking its lethal jaws deep into the throat, ripping out the windpipe, larynx, thyroid gland, and surrounding tissue. Blood dripped down the beast's jaws like water from a house gutter stuffed with leaves, matting the fur on its neck and chest and dripping on the warehouse floor. The creature kept moving toward the front of the warehouse. Two more employees rounded an aisle of boxes from a corner office room and walked right into the creature. The older of the two, a short, pudgy, phlegmatic man, hesitated longer than his younger teen colleague. The brief pause was costly and resulted in the man being brutally torn to pieces. With swift, arcing blows from the creature's muscular arms, the claws dismembering both upper limbs, while a third blow wielded much like a boxer's uppercut tore deep into the stomach, ripping out chunks of organs and the yellow fat tissue the medical community called visceral fat and the man's wife affectionately called her love belly. The younger man froze, mouth hung agape, standing rigid, paralyzed with fear at the spectacle of gore. The beast held the bloody tissue aloft like an actor displaying an Oscar and growled at the younger man while jet sprays of blood pumped out of each side of the stumps of the older man's arms like a nightmarish fountain sculpture. The man collapsed at the creature's feet and it hissed and growled at the younger man again, triggering him to take two steps backward. The hairy beast snarled, exposing bloody fangs and flung the hunk of bloody tissue at the man's chest. It struck his sternum with a whack, sounding like a fastball going into a catcher's mitt. Oomph! Fuck! The man squeaked, rubbing his chest and staring down at the bloody chunk of flesh sitting on the cement floor like a displaced piece of meat from the butcher station. The man staggered, screamed, and pivoted, desperately running for the door to the main grocery area. The beast leaped over the dead man and scampered on all fours, rapidly closing in on the escaping prey. It raised its right arm and stretched, sinking three claws into the man's back. The man shrieked and stumbled into the door, hitting his head, sliding down until his knees hit a hard object. A small anvil lay by the door to prop it open when carrying stock into the store shelves. The man picked it up, spun around, and threw it into the creature's chest just before the creature's formidable weapons struck again. The beast grunted and rubbed its paw over the spot, allowing the man the precious seconds needed to open the door and rush through, slamming and locking it behind him. The man crashed to the floor near the bakery, bleeding and crying as the first of many violent blows pounded against the door behind him. 
Bonnie Huffstetler just finished her selection of donuts and caught the man bursting through the door out of the corner of her eye. Oh, my God, are you all right, she said, rushing over to assist, setting the donuts down, bending over to check the man's condition. Delbert and Zelma Miller were exiting the frozen food aisle with their cart perpendicular to the bakery, and they too rushed over to assist, along with several other adjacent shoppers. Are you okay, young man? Delbert asked. He's bleeding, a polished-looking man in a business suit said, kneeling down to look at the extent of the man's injuries. He saw blood seeping through the front of the T-shirt in a growing shroud. You think? Bonnie asked in derision at the spiffy man's comment on the obvious. Mr. Business Suit glared at Bonnie. What happened, Zelma asked. The young man gasped, having difficulty breathing as blood filled the punctured lung. Must call police. Get a g- g- gun. Qu- quick. Get a what, Mr. Business Suit said. Did he say a gun? The pounding got steadily louder with each blow. What's that pounding noise, Bonnie asked. Everyone stopped talking and simultaneously turned toward the stockroom door. Thunk, 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 thunk. What is that noise, a petite redhead housewife new to the scene asked. We better call an ambulance and the police, Mr. Business Suit said. The butcher, Alex Purcell from the meat department, walked, walked over to examine the noise coming from the door. A look of irritation marked his full round face. What the hell is going on here? Who in the hell is banging on that goddamn door? Why is the door shut? He asked in a booming voice to everyone and no one, the latter responding to his boisterous questions. Thunk, 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 thunk. More people from other aisles started to gather from a distance, curious about the unusual scene unfolding in the store. The injured man choked and struggled to move, grabbing the arm of Mr. Business Suit. Don't let it get out. Must get The man gasped again and abruptly coughed up blood on the hem of Bonnie Huffstetler's cream-colored dress. With a final sigh, the gasping stopped and his eyes stayed open, staring at the large ceiling ductwork. The relentless pounding continued and intensified. Thunk, 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 thunk. Mr. Business Suit reached for his cell phone to call the police. Suddenly, another large thunk was accompanied by the ripping noise of metal hinges rupturing out of the door frame. Bonnie jumped back and grabbed the donuts to her chest in a defensive posture. What the fuck, the butcher said, moving away from the door. The thunks continued until the door exploded outward with several large bolts cluttering to the floor. The collective group of shoppers jumped back and watched in amazement and horror as a hairy caricature of an ape with canine features covered in blood hopped through the door and landed right next to the butcher. Bonnie dropped the donuts. The Millers clung to each other, shaking, and Mr. Business Suit gurgled out spittle onto his tie and dropped the cell phone. Sharpen takes a breath and cries were heard all around as people froze at the spectacle before them. The butcher stared at a bloody beast that was unfathomable for his limited imagination. All he could do was stand there and stare. The monster's arms began to move like helicopter propellers, claws tearing into the butcher's flesh. A bloody dismembered arm landed in the Miller's shopping cart on top of a six-pack of of Pepsi and a bag of frozen corn. A second later, the head sailed between Bonnie and Mr. Business Suit like a missile, striking a door in the frozen chicken section with such velocity and force that the glass shattered and the head flopped down on a stack of bagged chicken tenders. Pandemonium broke out in the store. Women screamed. Mr. Business Suit yelled, Jesus Christ! Other shoppers ran to see what the commotion was, running into people trying to flee from the ensuing bloodbath. Bonnie Huffstetler stepped back on her donuts, mouth hung open muttering, Oh no, oh no, 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 as the creature closed in on her. There would be no real estate broker meeting that morning for Bonnie. Wow. (laughs) That was was awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick. I, I was living that. I was. I think instead of reading it on my Kindle, I'm gonna. I'm gonna call you and make you read it out to me. You read that. <laughs> I, I know, right? Right. I'm thinking audiobook. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Yeah. Maybe. May, maybe. Definitely. Yeah. No. That was. That was awesome. And I have to say, I have actually read that bit. Um. But you. I mean, it, it, it leapt off the page as it was. But yeah. I mean, the, the way you write is 
he's very visceral. <laughs> you know, yeah. he don't shy away yeah. from the um, from the unpleasantness of, the, of it, which I think is what makes it. You know, it, it's it's like being. I, I I love the touch, the the, the woman. Um, sort of using donuts to protect herself, you know, <laughs> just those little those little abs- absurdities that, that just make it real. You know, that is something you would do. You just whatever you get, I've got to do yeah. donuts, whatever. But it's an instant. I yeah. love that. No, well done. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, well, I'm thank you very much. To, uh, I, I, I did choose the next chapter because that's where the beast really runs amok and decimates about sixty people, and that's when it gets pretty pretty feral and pretty gory, but uh, it's not gratuitous. There is a uh, to it, so yeah, I, I think you'll like it. Yeah, yeah, I really do. Well, we, we have uh, we have Stephen on the uh, on the line. I think he wanted to say hi, and uh, he's, he wanted to ask you something. Are you there, Stephen? Hello, how's it going? Mr. Helms, I'm very, very well. Were you listening to that? Oh, I was listening to every bit of it. It was awesome. And, uh, I, I had to um, my excerpt. That was an excellent excerpt you just read, and uh, you. you read it very well too. I mean, the excitement in your voice and everything—it was—it was very good. <laughs> right down to the donut part, I love that. I love that. <laughs> I love that bit. I said that's going to stay in my mind for a long time. <laughs> donut. Oh yeah, I mean, protection. You know, but, I think about um, every time I eat a donut from now on. Uh, I'm uh, have you got an audio book version of your book, or have you thought about making one? And if so, would you record it with you reading it? You know, I haven't thought of that, but now that you mention that, uh, that is something I would entertain. Uh, my day job does require quite a bit of public speaking and doing presentations in front of an audience. So uh, maybe an audio book is something that I can talk to Nick about if there's a you know, good ROI or return with that. Oh, yeah, I would love to have a copy of that on audio book with you reading it because, I mean, I was really into what you were just uh, going through right there. It was very good. But I have to ask you, though, I've been listening to your interview as uh, ever since you started, and you've been mentioning different things, and it's kind of been going fast. I can't remember everything. But you've gone from one point of horror to uh, more of a suspense thriller, such as you mentioned Seven earlier with uh, Morgan Freeman and I think it was Brad Pitt. And yeah. uh, then you turned around and talked a lot about martial arts. I have to ask you, you've got a wide range there. Who are some of your biggest influences on your story writing? Um, in martial arts, uh, my, my favorite, of course, uh, is, is Bruce Lee. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I never had the pleasure of meeting him because you know, he was gone um, you know, before my time. Uh, but my, t- my teacher, a gentleman named Greg Green, who's in Columbus, Ohio, uh, was very much a maverick in the martial arts community, very hardcore and barbaric. And when I was a kid, it started – his school was kind of a magnet for ex-Special Forces guys from Vietnam. And I kind of grew up yeah. having to fight with guys. And uh, uh, you'd hit them with everything you got, and they'd kind of smile at you and say, is that all you got? You could feel your heart about ready to burst out of its chest with fear. So I learned uh, some re- really cool stuff and a bunch of different animal forms and weapons forms. And we went full go, bare knuckle, fist to the face back in the day, and it was pretty barbaric. So I, I have a long-standing history with martial arts. Well, I tell you, I'm a writer myself, and I know that, you know, they say you write what you know. And when you listen to a person's writing, you can kind of tell a little bit about that person by their writing, you know, just by just listening to the words. And if you listen to several stories, you'll hear certain topics come up. And I've been listening to your interview, and I have to say I haven't read your book, but I'm very interested in it now. And uh, I I just kept hearing these things pop up, and the curiosity was just killing me. I had to ask you all that. I appreciate Very that, yes. Martial arts has been a big influence, not just on me personally and my philosophy, but uh, it's also been weaved into my writing. Yes. All right. Well, I just wanted to ask you that. I thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling thank in, you, Steve. Thank we'll speak to you, we'll speak to you well, again soon, well, thank you. sir. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice. Very nice, John. I think absolutely, absolute star, yeah. Um, so, Patrick, uh, so we, we're going to have to have to wind up now a little bit. Give give your book a plug again. It's called The Night It Got Out, and it's published by Black, Black Sheet Books with the great Nicholas Grabowski. And yeah, who he, who is up next, which is awesome. Um, it's been fantastic chatting to you, Patrick. I hope we can uh, certainly when when the detective novel is, is done and out. Please, please, please come back on the show and talk to us about that because and read more. I think we'll schedule in for a good hour of reading next time. 
I'd have to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> I could sit and listen to you read all day. That's great. I really enjoyed that. That was fantastic. Well, thank you. So it, so it's, well, I appreciate your time. You've been very kind. No, thank you for thank you for joining us. Is there anything else that you you would like to plug while you've you've, you've got a few seconds left? Um, I know that Nick is right on the verge of uh, releasing that little novella called "The Maggots Underneath the Porch," and I think everybody will will remember if, if they grew up in the '70s because I did a lot of research. So hopefully, I'm accurate, but I think everybody will enjoy reading that, uh, especially if you were a, a young boy growing up in the '70s. Uh, you'll look back on that with fond memories. Uh, of what it was like set against a horrific backdrop. Yeah, you know, I, I, I will look out for I I'm a child, I grew up in a child of the 70s. I uh, remember it like it was yesterday, <laughs> which is not as scary. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it sounds right up my street, that, you know. So, like, like they say, you know, n- nostalgia is not what it used to be. So when when is that, um, when is that actually going to be released? Is that by the end of this month? I think very, very soon, probably at any time. I know um, Nick is working on it as we speak. Okay. Well, we shall. Uh, knowing Nick, it will be broadcast the length and breadth of <laughs> social media, so I'm not going to miss it. I will certainly look out for that. That's fantastic. But, again, thank you so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Um, thank you, Patrick. And hopefully we'll get to, uh, get to chat to you again, sir. Thank you guys very much. You've been great. Okay. Speak to you soon. Cheers. So, Extina, we, we're running out. I, I, the reading was, was so good, I, 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 I could have <laughs> listened to another hour of that. So, you have um, a word or two from our sponsors. We're going to listen to a bit of music, and then it's going to be uh, Mr. Grabowski. So, over to you. Okay. Uh, check out Jaded Books Publishing's brand new website at www.jadedbookspublishing.com. Uh, Jaded Books Publishing is open submissions for Black Candy, the next anthology to be released Halloween Day. Black Candy's Halloween theme, so send in your best submissions with serial killers, monsters, creepy crawlies, and things that go bump in the night on Halloween. Submit submissions, oh wait, submit to submissions at jadedbookspublishing.com. The deadline is September 15th. Uh, Jaded Books Publishing is still accepting submissions for a special dark poetry anthology, A Lovely Darkness, Poetry with Heart, with all the proceeds going to St. Jude's for the week of September 15th through the 21st. Please see their Facebook page for submission guidelines. And don't forget to follow The Panic Room. Our Facebook page is unofficial, The Panic Room Radio Show. Twitter at Panic Room Radio. And our YouTube channel is The New Panic Room Radio Show. That's it. That's yes, sir. That's short, it. <laughs> shorter commercial break than we usually get. Okay, right. We're going to listen to um, a tune now. Um, this one is close to my heart. It's called Nightmare Machine by a, a local group, the Houston, Houston local to Houston group called the Marquis, Marquis of Vaudeville. And I particularly, I, I dug this one out. We actually use this as the closing tune to my short movie, First Impressions. Check it out on my website, www.jameslongmore.com. It's great. It's creepy, gruesome, a great little short story. <laughs> Award winning. Award winning. Don't like to talk awesome. about that too much. Um, <laughs> oh, you, you mentioned it. Um, but, yeah, listen, listen to it again. Fantastic tune, one I've not heard, heard for a long time. Um, so we'll be back in about, well, exactly four minutes, 40 seconds. <laughs> Yeah. 
darkness where the odds are slim and grim All the chances of escaping them Nightmare Machine there. Hope everybody liked that. Uh, great, great group. Local group to Houston. Um, Marquis of Vaudeville. Check them out on YouTube and wherever else you can find them. Like, certainly their album is <clears throat> pretty cool. I'd give them a shout. So, are we? Are we? Are we back in the room, Extina? Uh, I am. I am, and that was a really good song. I like that. I did, yeah. I mean, imagine that. Uh, as soon as I heard it, I thought, we've got to have that. <laughs> To the end of the movie. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> um, loving your your music choices. I am. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, again, it was another one. It popped up on the old iPad. Wow, I haven't heard because I haven't seen the movie for a long time. Um, yeah. You know, and it, it's just a great, great piece of music. You know, I really, really enjoy that. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm I'm glad. You know, people not start thinking. Well, <laughs> what is what is he thinking? What's going on with that man? <laughs> Oh, no, no, I, I, <laughs> no, I groove right along with every song so far. I'm like, yes, I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was, um, um, yeah, great. I'm great to speak to um, Patrick James Ryan there. You know, a, a great guy. Uh, I love his writing, and um, he's nice. Uh, it's always nice to, to get to, to talk to some of these people in person. You know, you, you, you read their works yeah. and sometimes touch base on Facebook or whatever writers forums and bits and pieces but to actually speak to them you know and and, and as writers we, we we're lonely people we are lonely you know people. speak for yourself i'm the bell of the ball okay <laughs> <laughs> but i do hear well maybe it's just me you know? no no i yeah. don't think it is just you but maybe i'm just a weird one i don't know i don't know yeah, I, you know I, i've been I've been told that uh, I have to stop thinking of myself as the sun, and maybe that's true, but I do think everything revolves around me, so, you know. All right, well, there you go. There you right. go, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> no, again, it's maybe, maybe part of the, the writer's condition. I mean, it, it, it's 
probably the only reason I really started mixing with, 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 with real writer, you know, and realizing that there are people out there who, whose brains are sort of wired as oddly as mine. Um, you know, and, and, and finding out that, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, there are traits that go along with go hand in hand with the job. Um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that is a comfort, but again, yeah, we are, we are solitary beings, you know, for the very nature that we, we sit and we, get in front of our computer or pad and paper yeah. or whatever, however we, we get the stuff out of our heads. And that's it. It's just us. And I think because we create our own little worlds, uh, yes. which, yeah. I'm, I'm quite happy there. You know, I mean, I my wife, you, you haven't been out. I've got some friends. I mean, I do have friends, honest, you know, that, that I, I will go out and I have to literally diarize it. And I, I need to go out and just go have a couple of beers with a friend or two and just, just to get out. Otherwise I will just forget how to talk to people. Um, or, or, or equally, I'll, I'll just pretend there's something wrong with my AT and T service, just so the mail come out. Just because <laughs> then I've got somebody to talk to. So <laughs> either way, I mean that's probably the saddest thing anybody's going to hear today. <laughs> <laughs> I so, actually really <laughs> thought your rant last week about AT and T was so funny. Oh my goodness, that was that was great. I loved it. <laughs> What you, and you know the, the the funniest thing of all was it wasn't meant to be funny. It wasn't meant as a comedy piece. That was hard. I, know, I, know. I was absolutely was awesome. at the end of my at the end of my tree with those people. But um, to be fair, the, the Courtney, the little the little guy who came through and fixed the other guy's mess, was an absolute star. Once we got past the dog thing, he was great. You know, so shout out to Courtney. You know, thank you for putting up with me and <laughs> being pissy. But uh, he did a good job. I mean, we we not having the technical issues we had last week. So um, bless him. Bless his little heart. Yeah. That's what I say. <laughs> so um, it is exciting for me. Um, we, we have a guy coming on now, Nick Gaboski from Black Bedsheet Books and an author in his own right and an awesome writer, um, a bit of a hero of mine. Um, I've worked with him. Uh, he he uh, published um, Bead, my creature novel uh last month now i think that was it came out um so yeah this will be i'm really looking forward to actually uh actually speaking to nick so hopefully 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 he said pressing buttons frantically um are you there nick <laughs> i certainly am james <laughs> hey! How are you? I bet you're pretty good. I just I realized uh, none of you might know exactly what my voice sounds like, so I thought I'd throw you off just for a second there. I, I thought I was I was talking to Prince Philip there for a minute. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what, James? I didn't expect your uh, English accent. I was going to say you got a nice Houston accent, but then I realized you came from England and you live in Houston now. So that right, explains right. that. But I just, I, for some reason, that kind of threw me off too. So. <laughs> it maybe also explains when you were when you were editing Pede why <laughs> there were certain English bits and pieces coming up like the, the, the odd you where there shouldn't be like you in colour and <laughs> I'm mean with an eye, you know. It's um, yeah, I do. I, 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 I do try to write non-English, um, and I, I have surprised a few people, but um, they do sneak in. They're, even the odd little phrase will sneak in. Oh, what, what does that mean? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> hey, Nick, absolutely fantastic to finally speak to you. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Jazzed to be on the show. And uh, now that I know that it's pronounced Xtina, hi, Xtina. <laughs> I <laughs> wasn't sure if the X was silent or not until I heard the show. So I heard the whole thing with uh, with Patrick. That was great. It was. It really I, was. I, that, that, guy, that guy can read. I have to say, I mean, you, you really need to think about an audio book with him reading it. That was, that was an awesome bit of reading, that. Well, not to mention he can write. He can write good, too. Well, <laughs> great. Of course. How you guys do? I mean, I'm impressed with your book, too, with Pete. That, that's awesome. It's awesome oh, stuff. You. I love creature Thank stuff. You. That's like right up my alley all the time. So actually, at heart, um, I, I love horror, but I love science fiction horror. I think more than the, the, the hacker slasher ones because they have a little bit more uh, something else going on. I, I don't know what exactly it is, but with, with creature flicks and things and, like, you know, stuff like that, it's just, like, awesome stuff. So I'm more than happy to publish this stuff, too. I mean, uh, yeah. so no, I'm I'm very proud of you guys. 
Well, and we, we we are immensely grateful for you as well. I think I said, I said before, you know, the the opportunity that you that other independent publishers offer, you know, we writers is you know absolutely second to none. You know, without you, we'd just be you know voices in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and of course, you know, as I said in the introduction, you, know, you you are an awesome writer in your own right. Um, I'll actually. Um, Again, I believe me, I'm, I'm not just saying this for the show. I do actually have the Everborn on my Kindle, and I've read the first couple of chapters. And I have to say, the first chapter of the Everborn is one of the best first chapters I've ever read. I mean, it just grabbed me and drew me in. You know, my again, my Honestly, only regret is I don't you. have as much time to read as I would like. You know, because I, I really want to get into that. You know, so um, but yeah, I mean, it just uh, the whole thing was just. The, the detail. It, it was you were there. You were there with the with the kids and, and the, the, the derelict building, and it was just all. What's going to happen? <laughs> oh yeah, Nigel, the the little boy that was in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the ice cream truck at the beginning. Yeah, that that was yeah, great. The whole that was thing. a fun to write. That that thing took me like twelve years to write. Actually. Oh really? Six years to actually write and submit to places like Zebra Books at the time around. 95, 94, something like that. And then uh, it was Zebra that I remember distinctly. They sent me a, um, um, a rejection letter, but it was, um, it, was, uh, it was odd because it was personalized to me <laughs> instead of, you know, the typical. Um, and, uh, and they actually gave me some good advice. And so in 95, when my life split, and I moved from Southern California to be up in, uh, with my uh, parents in Northern California when my sister went missing. Um, I, uh, I ended up staying up here, and after my sister was, was found dead, that kind of changed my life. I stayed up here with my parents, and I, I decided to go back to the Everborn. And um, uh, after hours, when I was working at Walmart and when I was doing other stuff, everything, I would, I would like, spend, like, hours until, like, five in the morning uh, at my f- parents' front porch just rewriting The Everborn, based a lot on, on what, uh, some of the things that Zebra told me, and, um, and then just reconceiving it. And uh, so another six years later, I, I got it published. But uh, so six and six is 12, so 12 years on that sucker. Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. I was very That's passionate true. about it. And you could see the science fiction side of me in that because it's about like alien greys, and stuff, but mm-hmm. it's it's definitely a horror book, and uh, and I got the blessings of Clive Barker with that too. He really really enjoyed it. That's where I got my my uh, Clive Barker quote that I put on my website and everything about I salute you and all that. It's from the Everborn. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. I I yeah. I I'm jealous. I mean, I'm a big big Clive Barker fan. Um, I got, I I got know, a, I a fellow Brit as well. Fellow Brit, fellow Northern Brit as well, which is awesome. But um, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's an accolade that you know I've been very well earned. But that can, you know, I'm sure Clive doesn't say things like that to just anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love um, Clive uh, too. Um, he's uh, well, I haven't talked to him in in quite a while, but I used to uh, I used to have to call up his secretary and um, um, tell him that I'd like to talk to him and leave a message. We talked for a little while. I forgot her name, Claudia, I think, and she had an English accent. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but um, she, uh, I'd leave a message, and I'd have to make an appointment, so then I'd get, like, nervous, and I'd have to wait for 5 o'clock and then ring, ring, and it's so fun. It's <laughs> Clive Barker, and we'd talk for a little bit sometimes back in the day. Cool. That was really cool. Uh, wow. But, uh, you know, you, you get to, the thing is with, with all writers and stuff, I mean, who am I? I mean, who was I back then? Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's longevity. It's where you place yourself. It's who you meet. You got to get involved in your industry. It's a lot of things that I say in a lot of interviews, too. I, I can go on if you get me started. But it's, it's, um, uh, it's where you place yourself and who you know. Uh, it's no matter what you do in life. If you decide what it is you want to do, you focus on that. You immerse yourself in it. If you want to be a freaking plumber, then, you know, you, you learn the trade inside and out. Then you learn the business. You go to the trade conventions. You, you, you know other plumbers. You communicate with the industry. It's like, it, and it's just like writing. And so then you're going to bump heads with, um, with people that um, are, 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 are better known than you and have that longevity in their belt and that you admire and that you idolize. 
and then, you know, then chances are they're going to like your stuff if you get them to read it, and then, you know, just one thing leads to another. So over the course of time, I've gotten, like, this nice, like, little stable of, like, people that I'm proud of that I've, I've grown up with and loved their works, and now they've said some praise to mine. It's one of the best things a writer can experience. Um, and, uh, you know, like Stephen King, Clive Barker, Joe Dante, Wes Craven, and stuff. But that's just being in the right places. And like I said, uh, when I was in uh, uh, growing up in Southern California, a lot of, um, oh, that's where Hollywood is, and that's where a lot of, you know, Dean Koontz in Newport Beach. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I went to a lot of book signings and, and hobnobbed and a lot of conventions and things and stuff. So it's... Uh, it, it's it's um, it's praise that I'm really really grateful for, of course, but it also took a lot of hard work in order to get their attention in the first place. So it's you know, it's a lot of hard work. It's it's uh, it depends on how you how you take it, how you view it, I guess. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. sound advice. I mean, it, it, it is. It, it's something that I, I, I've learned. I mean, I'm relatively new to the, the industry. Um, but, you know, you, your job doesn't finish when you finish the manuscript. In fact, in many ways, it's just starting. You know, you've got, um, you know, you, 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 like you say, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to take all the next steps. Uh, I mean, my, my, my background is actually sales and marketing. Uh, back in the day, I worked for the likes of Toyota for Duracell batteries. So, you know, I know the importance, obviously, of having a good product. But unless, I mean, you spot on it, you know, unless you get out there and work it, then you never get to, you never sell anything. You know, you never get to know people. Yeah, um, exactly. And there's you, different facets of working it too. Sometimes you have to yeah. think outside of the box. I hate saying that quote because it's so cliche now. But well, you know, I mean, <laughs> really. Um, but. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, like I said. It's just like anything else. You just have to you have to work hard at it. it, it and, you, and so many people actually do think that your job ends at the end of the manuscript, or at least at the end of turning the manuscript over to somebody else, <clears throat> like a publisher. And then you know they think that you take it over and that you you do what you want with it and stuff. And that's not really true. The writer has to actually you know not forget about the book. Have to do the opposite. Uh, they yes. they have to market it even more, even better once it's published. <laughs> no, hey, you know, oh, yes. I got something to put in people's hands. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. And, I, I, and you know, not not even that, but while you're writing, you know, say you you're done for the night, you put it up, you're still not done. I mean, it's still going through your head. You're still in that world. At least that's how it works for me. I mean, there are times that I just can't get out of it. Um, until I have everything written down or out of my head. So while you're in, you know, the mode of uh, writing a novel, you're in that world, and it's not something you can just, you know, if if you have a job outside of the home, you, you come home and you kind of, you know, wash your hands of it until the next day. But it's not quite like that for us writers, you know, that we're always thinking about what we're doing I, I find that you know yeah and distracted you can't quite focus on yeah. everything else as much as yeah. you should because you're always thinking about how am I developing that scene what am I doing with that scene <laughs> yeah. and sometimes you can't sleep at night yeah. or something too it's just yeah. I, I, I'm like that with with almost everything too I have to if I'm going to do something I have to focus on it and then get it done yeah. and then go on to yeah. the next thing and then on to the next thing and stuff and writing, I mean, when you're in the middle of writing a story, a short story or a book, uh, it's like you're, uh, you, you have to be obsessed with it. Uh, yeah. If that's a good indicator too, that it's that it's that you're going down the right path, that it's a, something good that you're doing, is if you're into it. Because if you're not into it, nobody else is going to be into it, and it's going to be a piece of crap. Um, but uh, if you're really enjoying it yourself and 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 immersed in it and that involved in it, then that's an indication that by the time it's done, and then when you polish it, you know. But by the time it's done, uh, uh, it's something that you're going to be proud of too. How can somebody yeah. not pimp that and promote that? How can somebody like put that in a closet somewhere? It's ridiculous. So you know. Right. I think no. I mean, you, yeah, you, you, you're right. You know, but I, I, I think you know now. now <clears throat> excuse me. Now you know I've got some some books published. You know, and I'll be, I'll have, having to then, at least I, I can't just forget those. I'm getting involved in marketing them and doing what I need to do. Is staying focused on my next job, on the next book. 
Um, you know, when obviously other space starting to eat into that, eat, eat into that time. Um, that I must admit is is something I'm I'm learning. I'm having to learn to adapt to because um, I, I before you know um, I, my books were out there. You know, I thought right, and, you know, it finishes the minute you know publishers said right, yeah, we'll take this. And I thought, oh, that's great. <laughs> but you know, even I mean <laughs> Stephen King, he he still does book signings. He still goes on speaking tours. I mean, not that he needs to, but no. he will still right. do that. He's probably contractually obliged to do so, but you know he's still doing that. You know, maybe to, to reach a new new audience, as I, you know, you've just got to keep going. Well, it also kind of shows you that he enjoys doing it too. So it's it's um, it's just all part of you know just uh, writing something and then showing it to the world and then enjoying people enjoying it, you know, and going out and actually see them loving the book and wanting you, you know. I mean, there's there's something too that that probably drives him. I mean, if that wasn't going on, he would probably just as soon stay at home. I'd assume. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes it, any sense. No, it it de- it definitely does. Um, and you know what? I have to ask you this because, um, and I, I'm hoping that you don't get this question all the time. Um, I I think one of my favorite uh, franchises, as far as horror movies go, is. Halloween, and that's something that every time I see your, you know, anything to do with you, I think of the Halloween, was it four? I think it was four. Yeah, Halloween four. Uh, uh, I just, tell me stuff. Tell me something. <laughs> well, I, I, I you know, I, I can tell you how I got to writing the book for Halloween four. I never really yeah. get tired of that. It's um, like around... Uh, uh, 1987-ish or something, when I came out with my first book under my, my original pen name, Nicholas Randers. The book was called mm-hmm. Prey, Serpents, Prey. My publisher at the time, that was my first book I ever wrote, and it, it got accepted. Uh, but that wow. goes back to, awesome. you know, sometimes being around the right people. I wanted to be an actor, and uh, my uh, acting teacher at the time was uh, Walter Koenig, uh, who played Chekhov in Star Trek, the original Star Trek. And, oh, wow. Um, uh, his sister, uh, his publisher, he, he was coming out with a book called Buck Alice and the Actor Robot, a uh, science fiction book, and his publisher's sister, Janice, was in the class. So I told them, hey, I just wrote this book, Pray Serpent Spray, this horror novel. Uh, and uh, so she sent it to her brother in New York, and then three months later, he calls me, and I, like, kiss the neighbors and and two <laughs> cartwheels uh, out in the front, and you know, I, I got published. Right. I even never even published a short story. It's the first thing I ever got published was a novel, mass market paperback horror novel, and um, and then so awesome. uh, he started sending me other projects because because I quit my job uh, as an overnight security guard, and um, and then I, I started uh, doing um, like Marcina Shane books for hire, like romance novels. Um, it, it's another pen name that I went under. And I got paid for that off and on. And then uh, one day the publisher calls me up and he says, hey, uh, they're doing another Halloween movie. Mm -hmm. And Michael Myers is back in it. And uh, I've got the screenplay. How would you like to do the book? Because uh, the job came to us. And and I said, yeah. And so (laughs) they sent me the screenplay. And I got to um, uh, sit down, and, and it's the first time I ever did anything like that. But And I noticed that when you were talking uh, on the Patrick's show this last hour, uh, you mentioned something about screenplays, and then it's harder to write um, uh, a screenplay based on a book. Uh, but for me, actually, it was it was kind of easy because the plot and everything was already there for you. You just had to just, you know, use your narrative and... Uh, and just go page by page and using narrative, and I added some personal stuff to it because I realized it's now or never. You know, I'm going to do this. So like some, like um, like special things that my family would get and stuff. But um, uh, I uh, I I ended up writing that when I was uh, living in Anaheim uh, in the back room of my uh, uh, one of my best friends' houses with his little Korean mother, like, knocking at the door all the time, saying, nah, nah, what you doing there? And I, I'm, I'm writing, I'm typing, and I was doing Halloween 4. And, stuff. So, and that ended up getting published, and, you know, 
Uh, the thing is with that book, they uh, didn't use my Nicholas Randers name. If you check mm-hmm. out the original paperback, mass market paperback by Critics' Choice paperbacks, um, it says Nicholas Randers on the copyright page, and they put my real name on there without even consulting me. But it turned oh, wow. out for the best because I, I've been my real name ever since, and uh, it kind of changed things. Otherwise, I guess you'd be talking to Nicholas Randers or something um, right now. But um, so, uh, uh, and that was that was very interesting because the book came out at the same time that the movie came out, and by then I I had published two books, that and Prey Serpents Prey, and uh, then a couple of like the little mini ones by Marcina Shane. Um, and uh, I still wasn't making en- enough money, so I had to get another job again. And I ended up working at Video Giant, and it shared the parking lot with an Albertson supermarket. And inside, I always used to buy, like, horror paperbacks and stuff, and I, I would go in, and there would be mine. There would be Prey Serpent Spray and Halloween 4 next to Stephen King, Dean Koontz, oh, Robert so Cameron, cool. and, <laughs> and stuff, and that was so cool. And people would actually buy them and go across the parking lot and have them um, uh, have me sign them for them while I was rearranging the shelves at Video Giant and my boss would be telling me I'm not working fast enough <laughs> it's like that, that, that's, that's pretty much my, my publishing origin story <laughs> however small that it, that it is, is working nice. at Video Giant that goes to show oh, you though sorry. that unless you're this was a big publisher. I mean, they published a lot of stuff, but still, I think that I, I kind of got screwed too. I didn't have a contract for Halloween Four. I never got paid for it, um, and uh, the the contract was supposed to show up, and it never did. And then the publisher went bankrupt, and there wasn't anything I could do about it. But it ended up getting me an agent. And, you know, it's a long story, but I mean. Not everybody, especially in this day and age when the market is so saturated and um, the big publishers uh, and there's little publishers and um, it's really hard actually, you know, when you start off to actually say that I, I made it now. There's a lot more work to be done. You have to like yeah. climb the ladder just like anybody else and climb that mountain and stuff. And I, I used to get razzed all the time um, after uh, Halloween 4 and Prey Serpents Prey and some of the others came out. Uh, I would like go to like say a bar and the subject would be brought up and they'd say no way. No, and most people wouldn't believe me. And sometimes I would have to show my ID. And you know, ironically, <laughs> thank God my real name is on the cover of those books now because when I show my ID, it, it ain't Nicholas Randers, it's Krabowski. People would have gone, uh, that doesn't say Randers on it. And so, right. and that forcing me to up. use yeah. my real name, that kind of worked out in the end. But people used to ask me about that too because they thought that I still, I, who are you? Oh, yeah, really? Halloween 4. Uh, and then it turned into when I used to hang out with, like, a lot of L.A. bands and stuff and get drunk with them. Um, there would be, like, uh, I'd, I'd go see one of their gigs, and uh, they would, like, see me in the audience and stop, and the lead singer would point to me and go, Halloween 4! <laughs> yeah, anyway, I, I went off on a little... No, hey, no, that was a great story. I mean, you obviously... You know, been. You know, I'm, I'm trying not to. You know, saying you've been around a lot. You know, um, you've obviously been writing for a, a, a lot of years. You know, it's. Um, uh, you know, I, I, hopefully, you know that we, we we do get quite a lot of you know, writers listening in. You know, that they can take something from that. That yeah, you, you, it's not overnight. You know, you, you do have to work at it and put yourself out there. And it, yeah, it, and it ain't going to happen so it's overnight. Like another job. No. Yeah. It, 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 not, to, yeah. not to say it can't, because it has in some yeah. ways, like almost like for J.K. Rowling. <laughs> it seemed like, yeah, even though her, she started on the napkin nine. and stuff, but when she got discovered, and you know, yeah. but that I mean that kind of thing is rare, you know. And don't her expect that. Was... Nobody should expect that of themselves either. I, I see, yeah. I see people that have their first book out. Nobody knows who they are, <clears throat> and they get such big heads. They get such yeah, big yeah, heads yeah. because, oh, I'm published now and everything. I'm, I, yeah. And I have to tell them, and sometimes, you know, that, uh, 
couple of a couple of writers won't talk to me because of that too, because they they <laughs> got big heads, and I told them not to basically. <laughs> yeah. Tried to like say, hey, you know, you got to be humble, and people aren't going to like you when you're like that. Um, yeah. And but it's surprising how you know sometimes some people <laughs> I don't know, but uh, I, yeah, they, so they it, do, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, you have to you have to just um, you have to be persevering and you have to be everything that you possibly can be uh, to better your book and yourself. And it and includes a good demeanor and a good repertoire with your industry and and um, and people getting to like you enough to want to read your book too. Yeah, that that is That's something right. too. you yeah. have to sell yeah. yourself. You have to. Dude, they have yeah. to like you. Um, I I know me, that myself. I mean, for a really long time before um, I actually before Dark Masons came out, um, I I was a blogger and I dealt with a lot of yeah, a lot of indie authors and um, I would notice that the ones that I would try to talk to and they would be just. I don't know, they just, some of them just acted like they, they didn't have time to talk to me or, you know, who are you or, and those ones, even if they had, oh my goodness, even if they were a good writer, I would find myself shying away from reading their books just because I wasn't, I didn't really like them. And um, so you do, you have to sell yourself. You have, people have to like you, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you've got nothing to lose by it too. I mean, who's to, they say that, um, that um, a, a bad press is good press. I guess the cliche is, and you can you can be an asshole enough, but you could be a famous asshole, and people will be curious and want to buy your book. <laughs> I guess maybe there that can something. happen too, but that's rare also. So you know, yeah. the good manner of principle is just be, and just for human beings, for humanity's sake, just be kind to everybody and be <laughs> nice. People are going to nice. like you. Yeah. Get them to like you. That's just the best route to do. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's an old adage from back from my sales days. You know, as a salesman, you know, you pe- people buy from people. You know, your, your product could be the best on the planet, but as you're saying, you know, if you're a complete art, <laughs> they ain't going to buy it, you know, <laughs> no matter yeah. how good it is. You know, so <laughs> like presenting totally the image, uh, that are you good enough to read my book? You know, <laughs> or yeah. like that. I mean, who's going to buy it? <laughs> probably, probably no one. <laughs> Just on principle, you know. I'm not. No, I'm not going to put money in your pocket. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So there, yeah, there, there, there is. A, I've, I've heard the old adage that you might say there's no such thing as bad publicity, but yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Is, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's. Um, I, I, you know, I, I like, I like, you know, your philosophy. You know, stay humble. You know, and again, it, it goes for. Anybody, you know, music, you know, music star, movie star, you know, mm-hmm. best plumber in the world, whatever, you know, you you need to to, to keep grounded because as soon as you, you you're not, I think you know, that's when people sort of lose it. Yeah, yeah, yeah they certainly do, and it shows. Yeah. Uh, I was just, you know, a good example is uh, like America's Got Talent that I watched last night. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, the the, um, the auditions uh, that they have, uh, and you could see the amount of work that each contestant puts into it, and and they they, you know they they tell the whole world that this is what this is my dream, this is what I really want to do, and you could see how how hard that they've worked for it, and hell they've stood in line for days just to be there. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, and and then um, uh, you know, and and it shows. I mean. Um, if you're not passionate about what you do, if none of these people were passionate on that show, then they wouldn't be there. Somebody else would have taken their place. And yeah. you've got to ask yourself yeah. sometimes, do you want somebody else to take your place and you could just fiddle your thumbs at home, or are you going to actually oh, um, take some initiative and uh, yeah. go out there mm-hmm. and, and tell everybody that you're alive and that you write and that your writing is worth um, reading and you're going to heavily enjoy it be entertained by it you're going to get your money's worth uh give me five dollars and you're going to get more than than you dreamed of in this little book that i'm giving you by me Um, yeah and be be passionate and take pride in what you do um i think that is one of my pet peeves right now as far as especially the the indie book world um i i 
the, you know, being a blogger for as long as I, I blog for, um, I would run across so many books that, oh, just the editing was awful. The, you know, and, and I'm thinking, is, is somebody so, um, do they just want their, you know, quote unquote, 15 minutes of fame and, you know, we'll, we'll put out anything, but take pride in what you're doing, you know, really. Yeah. No, yeah. No, I, I could agree more. Yeah. Yeah. It shows, I mean, I think, I mean, and when it when it shows, then people will pay attention to. Yeah. It ain't like the yeah. '60s with the road books and with all the you know uh, the hippie culture books where there's all these insensitive uh, but passionate writers that just write something they don't give a damn about anything in itself and they <laughs> have to read it in college. <laughs> yeah. It ain't like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I we mentioned we and all, all that. This in, in previous weeks, you know, about obviously the, the phenomenon of self-publishing, how easy mm-hmm. it is to self-publish and get your work out there now. And I I, I, I came across a, an extreme horror book. And I, you know, that sounds really good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that. And it, it was it was terrible. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the, the ideas were yeah. good. You know, some of the stories yeah. were, yeah, great. But like you said, it, it, was, it was badly edited. It was, it was obviously nobody did not bothered with the mis- Mr. And the, the thing is, because I, I did actually complain about it, and I don't often do that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they, they got back to me and said, "Well, if you could just tell me where the mistakes are." Well, no, I'm not. Be, I'm not. I'm not spending my money to be your editor. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, oh, again, that's like right. said, you know, if you're going to put it out there, even as a self-published person, take some pride in it. For goodness' sake, yeah. at least read oh, yeah, it through yeah. and yeah. pick People, out. I mean, you can mistakes. publish anything, and that's um, that's what really made it difficult for the longest time with the industry struggling and changing because of the fact that so many people, I, I mean, the industry was getting oversaturated. And you knew yeah, pretty much that if you bought a book by the New York Times best-selling authors and, you know, uh, the big wigs in New York and stuff, uh, um, that chances are it's going to be a good book. And, you know, and then yeah. Who's this Joe Schmo that um, it's not published by anybody? That the book looks interesting, but it turns out to be a piece of crap. And there's so many of those. Yeah. That's where um, you know publishers like Black Bedsheet and Jade come in, <laughs> where um, you know <laughs> you legitimize yourself by being accepted by a publisher. Because if you're accepted by a publisher that's investing in you and that that wants to give you the time of day, then they do it for a reason, um, and that. That in itself, like, tells you, okay, well, my book's good enough. And if not, you know, then we'll say try again. It doesn't work out quite, you know, like we want. And, eh, there's problems with your writing and stuff. Then you know, then take that and stuff. That's that's a big problem that I have with the ability to self-publish. But on the other hand, <laughs> ironically, the ability that the industry has given us to self-publish has uh, made publishers like us happen. Because now, yes. consequentially, it's easier to be a publisher. Um, mm-hmm. I never would have dreamed back in the day when I used to submit to the big time publishers and even the small publishers. We didn't have an internet, Hello? and we we didn't have all these things that we do right now. And um, and uh, uh, I, I just I never thought I'd be Hello? a publisher, but now I mean you know, but still. You know, but still it, it legitimizes you. It, legitimizes uh, you. it, 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 it shows that uh, that you're worth that somebody pays attention to you. So it's 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 better actually to look at people that actually have been published instead of people that just come out with like anything and it's and it's all them. Not to say that there aren't good self-published books because there are. Right. Most. There are. Most mostly there aren't, and but that's a good indicator. If you're going to try a book by an author you've never tried before, go with somebody that's that's been published, even by a small press, maybe especially by a small press. <laughs> yeah, I, I so, think right. yeah, I, I would agree. You know, I mean, it, it, it adds that level of, I suppose, as, as, as a customer, as a consumer, you know, that le- that level of. Um, I suppose legitimacy that you know this. I am going to spend my you know five, ten, fifteen bucks, and I'm going to get my money's worth. You know, I, I'm, I'm because yeah. I'm a Yorkshireman. I am mean. <laughs> I'm so thrifty. I think we should say we are a thrifty, thrifty race. The Yorkshire people. So I want to know. I'm going to spend fifteen dollars. I'm going to be thoroughly entertained for 
however long it's going to take me to read that book, you know? Um, yeah. And, I, yeah, the, the, the one that I – and I have read a lot of independent – works now but I, I don't think i would buy a self-published work like that again because of that that experience there might be some brilliant self-published stuff out there but it, that one yes, I, he, the, the fact that he put that out there and then had the audacity to ask people to edit it for him was just beyond <laughs> comprehension for me so, seriously you know if, if you want me to edit it fine i'll edit it but pay me <laughs> you know, just, well yeah, yeah certainly yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's the thing is that there are really good self-published books out there. There really are. I've, I've ran across numerous that are just amazing. But mm-hmm. then you find, but it, it's so, it, it's kind of few and far between. And um, that is the problem right there is how do you, how do you decipher which ones are going to be good ones, which ones aren't. And you have no clue until you just dive in and, um, sometimes that's a lot of freaking wasted time, and I think it's yeah. really bad for the good authors, the ones who actually are really good. Um, I have a these I have these um, these authors that are um, they're self published. Um, they have put out I think like nine or ten books now, and you know they try to get uh, you know they try to submit to big publishers, small publishers, and nobody would take them, and they are freaking amazing. Um, and mm-hmm. every time I've, I've read any of their books, I can't find any mistakes, and I think they're just such good writers. Um, and they even said now that if they were approached by a publisher, they they probably would not go with them because um, they like the freedom that they have, you know, to do whatever they want, and um, they're good. But that is not the norm. Um, it, it's really yeah. not, and I hate it. it is I hate very it. hit and miss, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so thank when... God for the opportunity, though. That's That's what... I, I like about um, uh, overall about the ability to self-publish and and uh, and what we can do online now, uh, publish mm-hmm. our own books and 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 that. I mean uh, because you know th- there's been books submitted to me by authors um, that uh, have already self-published their own book, but they want to get it published mm-hmm. anyway, and they would ask me, would you take this and Say well, it depends on how good it is, but uh, you know. Right. Um, but uh, <laughs> cool. you know, and then uh, and then I've had some of them. I've had uh, I've I've had so many authors that there's been a few that decided at the end of their contract that they um, don't want to have anything to do with publishers. They want to do it themselves now. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. there's all kinds of reasons for that too. Some of them are like me; they're take charge kind of people. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they do want to do it themselves <laughs> when they see how it's done. Or, or they see that they could do a better job, or, or you know, whatever. Some of them, some of them can, uh, with their resources, they can do a better job. I mean, it's all, it all depends on what what you could do, where where you're at with your book and who you know and stuff too. I mean, yeah. geez, sometimes, um, uh, uh, if you think that you can do a better job, then do it. Um, but you know, it's like publishers like me. Uh, even though I have uh, like high, high, high hopes for Black Bed Sheet in the future, um, I, uh, uh, I, I still. What's important to me, actually, and I had to ask myself this: is um, what, what, what are your priorities? And I found that um, it, it seems like what drives me the most, also, is this untapped talent, taking writers that have extraordinary talent that um, that's worthy of being invested in and being pushed to the world um, you know however way you can do it for them and uh, um, and to give them that boost in hopes that you know then they'll be they'll be a greater and greater success and then they'll be able to go to like uh, uh, they don't want to stay with me go to the New York publishers and get this huge deal because that's what mm-hmm. it's all about anyway. You know, so I, I like to give people a big lift up. And that's it's really a joy being their first um, publisher and everything and being responsible for a big neighborhood celebration just because I published their book for them <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like it brings joy to people's lives, and it's great. I've cried over some of the reactions that people have given me. And I know where I stand, and I know how I operate my business and everything. And to me, it, it doesn't seem that way. But if I take myself and put myself in their shoes, 
like nobody's ever paid attention to their writing before, and now suddenly, you know, they've they've got hopes and they've got this small publisher that's going to put them out into the world. Then, you know, that that does bring them joy. And from all walks of life, even from actors that have movies out, um, and or or have have bands and stuff. Uh, uh, they would like tell me, actually, you know, I like writing better than acting, and I really want to be a writer better than an actor. I'm going, you got these movies, <laughs> like Matthew Ewald, for example, is one of my authors. He's a great author. He's, he's been uh, in a lot of places. He was um, in Fox Kids uh, Galador, and um, uh, a terminal error in the movies, and a bunch of things, mm -hmm. and... Um, he uh, he told me uh, that I've made his dream come true just by publishing him, and that's kind of oh. hard to swallow. But that's yeah. the kind of thing that drives me as a publisher is I, I, I feel like I'm doing some good. I'm helping people. I, I'm not in it for myself just for that anymore. I mean, I love my works, and I love to write, too. But I also love to publish <clears throat> and because of these reasons. And so it's, like, great. Sometimes I give myself more work than, than is reality and I, I back up uh, my uh, my schedule a bit but that's because you know oh, I gotta publish them if I don't somebody else will and I gotta have this person and you know um, but uh, it's just it's it's really good to actually see um, uh, that, that I can like be of some help in this world with the industry that I chose for myself I guess that's the best way to put it I, yeah, and I, I think it boils down to I mean, if, you, if, you, if you if you're doing what you love, you know, if that's if it gets mm -hmm. back to the passion that you mentioned, that, you know, if if that's where it is, then you know, yeah, you're going to enjoy it and get the most out of it. It's, it's you know, the, again, back to cliches. Life is is too short to be bloody miserable. You know, um, yeah. I I came in. I, I've always wanted to write from being you know small wee child you know um really yeah, only okay. started getting the chance five or six years ago um and yeah it's tough and it's a struggle and you know uh grateful to the end of my days for my wife for giving me the opportunity to do that but I, i've never been happier never been poorer to be honest <laughs> i miss my old days of sales commissions and bonuses and company <laughs> cars and that but hey you know I, i've never been yeah, you know, and it, 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 it's, it's something to be said for that, you know, and, um, you know, it, it's, you know, f follow your heart, I guess, if, if that's what you're meant to do. Um, yeah, It's like, exactly. you know, music, it's like, it's funny, but Paul McCartney, you know, he's still churning out music, and he, he certainly doesn't need the money, but, right. you know, you, you can, you can if, if he didn't make that music, it would stay in his head, and it would drive him insane it's like you know extremely you saying you have that a character that will not leave you alone you know until yeah she's written she's down on the page she's going to rattle around in your head until you you know it drives you to drink or <laughs> sort of work you know? <laughs> and you, you, know, can, you can see that you know yeah. it's funny i, I read yeah. sorry interesting statistic writers apparently is one of the, the professions with the the longest uh highest longevity it's also one oh, of the wow. ones with the highest suicide rate Oh, yeah. so you either live yeah, a long, long time, that. or you kill yourself, you know, <laughs> and don't live a long time. You know. um, so it, it, it's an extreme, you know, because I guess if you don't get those things out of your head, I could imagine it would drive you absolutely yeah. crazy, you know. And I, I get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah a, really. it's a weird world. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten that too. That's 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 why it took me twelve years, for example, to write the Everborn because I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't just, you know just give it up it had to be told <laughs> just, yeah. i had yes. to finish it yeah and then then go on to, to the next thing. thing too that's another thing once you're finished with the book if you're a writer you're going to go on to something else you're going to keep writing yes. and some writers yeah. just have this one book and they have that book they haven't written in five years since they've written that book and they they still say that that's what i really want to do i just gotta get around to it yeah. <laughs> it's like no you just you keep on writing you just, just have to yeah. keep on yeah. writing yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and you know and just don't if you're if you write books to, the, here's another thing too just a short little thing, um, um, some people just stick to writing like full novels, and they expect that novel to like run its course and stuff. I I think that it's really a good idea while that book is running its course and you're doing your best to like you know push it and 
your publisher, whoever else is behind it. Write short stories and send them to magazines in the meantime. Mm-hmm. Do other, like, little in-between things yeah, okay. that keep yeah, yourself yeah, going. Advice, and, yeah. and it's kind of yeah. like lifting weights, too. The more you do it, the better you get. The yeah. more pumped up you get. You know, it's like, it, uh, and I've always said, and it's a cliche, uh, um, that uh, practice makes perfect. You just got to yeah. <laughs> keep doing keep doing it. The more you do it, the better yeah. you get. And, yeah. you know, and, and so forth. And, and just write short stories in between and different things. And don't don't focus on the next novel all the time. Just to, that's a way to get your stuff, yeah. your stuff mm-hmm. out. People that don't read books will read these magazines with your short story in it and go, oh, and then they'll get turned on to you. Then they'll want to read more of you, and then they'll read your books mm-hmm. and stuff. One thing leads mm-hmm. to another. You never know. But keep putting yourself out, even if it's a bit of poetry. Send that poetry somewhere. Yeah. And you know, yeah. it's like publicity. Yeah. Too. So on on on, <laughs> on on that, Nick, we're we're gonna have to say goodbye. I'm afraid we're very nearly out of time. I'm afraid. I, oh, yes. I could oh, wow. I could I could talk to you all day. So I know this <laughs> this hour went by so fast. <laughs> I, 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 now, now I have now I have your phone number. I'm just gonna ring you up anyway and just chat. So <laughs> <You've been warned. laughs> we do a three way. I want to be there too. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Go for it. Go for it. So Nick, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a, a, a pleasure. Absolute dream come true. Thank you. Oh yes, it was wonderful talking to you guys. We would love to have wonderful. you on again. <laughs> okay. Well, we're gonna say goodbye. We're gonna we're gonna finish on a tune and um, so hopefully. You, Come back on the show very, very soon. All right. Yes. Okay. Thank you for having me. Uh, Thank you, Nicholas. Have a great rest of your day. You're welcome. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. So uh, sad to see Nick go. Um, We're we're going to wrap up now, and um, hopefully we'll see people next time. Say goodbye, Chris. uh, Sorry, Christina. (laughs) <laughs> bye, bye, bye James bye, bye everybody <laughs> have a jolly one
Mako, one of the ocean's most ferocious predators, unrivaled in power, unmatched in speed. Until now, Mako, the tallest, fastest, longest coaster in Orlando. Now open at SeaWorld. Feel the predator power. For a limited time, get a single day ticket for $79. Only at SeaWorld. Taxes, service fees, and parking not included. Restrictions apply. New phone? Yeah, it's the Samsung Galaxy S7 Active. It's shatter and water resistant, and you can only get it at AT&T. Here, look. Oh! oh. The phone! Why are we slowly lunging for it? Force of habit! The shatter and water resistant Samsung Galaxy S7 Active, exclusively at ATT. ATT, mobilizing your world. Shatter resistant when drop less than 5 feet on a flat surface IP60. Water resistant less than 5 feet for up to 30 minutes. Winds residue when dry drops may cause scratches and other damage to screen and body. See a store rep for more details.